at 6.39. Good morning to you. This is Breakfast with Stephen and Anne. Now, we, we were talking just a few minutes ago about the fact that um, with the combination of the rail strike uh, you know, and crumbling schools, if you're going to try and get to school, uh, you may not be able to. I used to travel by train. Mm. Um, and Jeff has emailed in and says, Anne, love the show, but we have railway stations, not train stations. I was talking about train stations. Oh, However, well. we have a picture which rather proves my point. It says train station. That's at Potter's Bar. Yes. In Hertfordshire. So there you go. Hmm. There you Maybe go. Maybe we've got both. Railway stations and train stations. Though I have to say, railway stations does sounds sound better. better. Yes, it does. Yeah. Just sounds, sounds more English. So how did you get to school? Chris says we walked and talked. Yeah, which is nice. Uh, Anne-Marie, I walked three miles to and from every day in all weathers. Uh, we loved it, chatting with my friends. It was a great time to chat and have fun with friends. Yeah, and Martin says, point. I used to walk five miles to school, only aged six. That's a lot. Mm. Down a long country lane. Back then, if your mum came with you to school, you were considered a bit of a sissy. Can you say <laughs> sissy these days? I think so, can't you? I don't think so, no. Oh, sorry. No, I don't think so. It's acceptable to say sissy. It was no. one of those words that you used to use. It's, it's a bit... Am I being a bit woke? Yeah, you're being woke. You're being woke. Stop it at once. I always thought it was a bit homophobic. Never thought say. of it like that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Because you were never at the other end of it, you see. That's no, I right. uh, see. Yeah, true, <laughs> true. But if you think, oh, maybe you think I'm being a snowflake, which I would take great offence <laughs> Oh, yeah, let us know if you think he's a snowflake. Oh, my God, can you imagine? GBviews at gbnews.com. Yeah, I'm no snowflake, believe <laughs> you me. Uh, let's have a look at the Daily Mail. Hundreds more schools at risk, it says. Uh, education being thrown into chaos by the concrete crisis. And when will this school crisis end, asks parents, on the front of The Times today. A concrete ticking time bomb hits hospitals. That's in the Express. And in today's Telegraph, the Home Secretary accuses woke police officers of damaging public trust in them. And for the star, temperatures may hit 30 degrees this month. So it says. <laughs> I look forward Fingers to that. crossed. Yeah. I hope it's sunny as well as warm, that's the point. Yeah, yes, Not yes. warm and, and sort of manky. Moggy. Yeah, it was the way it was a while manky. ago. <laughs> Sorry, is that not a good word? No, either? manky's manky. great. Yeah, good. Uh, let's talk to the assistant editor of The Spectator, Cindy Yu, and the political editor of HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield. Good to see you both. Hi. Hi. Um, let's have a look at this Telegraph story, should we? Um, the Home Secretary says some police are damaging public trust. Yep, so Suella Braverman has given an interview to The Telegraph um, in which they're talking about Rwanda, talking about policing, immigration, all sorts of different things. But the biggest line from it is that she's going to push through reforms that uh, will basically help police commissioners to tell their local policemen not to be too woke. So stop taking the knee, stop opining on Extinction Rebellion or LGBT issues. Just catch the burglars. Just catch the burglars. Mm. <laughs> Which I think is very, you know, it's very understandable. But actually it's something that the police chiefs themselves have been saying. So Mark Rowley, uh, the Met chief this week, has himself said, you know, you need to, you can wear a poppy, but anything more than that, politically speaking, as policemen, you don't need to opine on that. Yeah. So this is good, you know, seen, going back to just basically standard level policing. And this is what we want, you know, actual crimes that are being uh, looked at rather than thought crime. Someone said to me, but I can't think who it was, it might have been, it might have been Chris Akabusi, who said lately that what, what, rather than sort of say, opining to these communities, um, the way you, you, you sort of um, get their approval, if you like, is solving crimes which are happening within their mm. communities. And that's yeah. all you need to do. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what people expect from their police officers. They're not really bothered about what, the, what their political opinion is. And I guess this follows on from what Suella Braverman said earlier in the week about basically telling the police focus on crime, basically focus on solving crime, catching criminals, um, and you can leave all the other stuff to one side. I, it feels to me like she said this before. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Oh, possibly. The attack on woke. I mean, she's attacked woke everything, but the woke police officers, I think, because that's under her remit. I'm pretty sure she said it before, but I've been in that position before where you've got an interview with the cabinet minister and they don't say anything particularly new, so you have to try and flam it up a little bit. So I think Leave that's what maybe, maybe, maybe what's happened. You would never do that, Kevin. I've <laughs> <laughs> perish the thought. Perish. No, no, no. I tell you what, though, what you've been looking at in The Times is this business of, you know, the, the, the wrong concrete um, and how many buildings it is uh, going to affect in the end. Well... It's scary. I mean, if you've got kids going back to school next week, um, you're dreading the, the email or the phone call from the school to say, actually, 
um, or having to close the school, mm. um, which would be an absolute nightmare. Not long after the pandemic, obviously, and kids having to um, uh, learn from home then. But yeah, I mean, it, it looks as though this could potentially just be the tip of the iceberg. I mean, right now it's around about 150 schools have been identified, but it could be many more um, because there's, all the schools are now having to analyse the structures to see if this um, type are of... Are we over-egging it a little bit, though? In the, I looked at a list of schools that are now known to have be affected by this. There's only about 20 or 30 on the list. Mm. But a lot of them were saying you know, that they're having to delay the return to school by a day. Yeah. Or something like that. So it's actually not going to be that they're spending the next term working from home or whatever. No, I think you're right. I think, um, and I think the, the majority of them, uh, the schools will still open. There'll be the odd room in the class which might have to be made structurally safe and I think the government is probably erring on the side of caution but I guess that's understandable what you because don't yeah, want yeah. is for god forbid something terrible to happen and it comes out that ministers were warned and didn't do anything about it um but I think it's just the, the timing as much as anything just before kids go back after the summer break but it might not just be schools I, I know at least a one court that's had to yes. close which and they're Harrow, talking about hospitals potentially hospitals. so um, you know, this could really be a major it's wherever this, this building material was used it, 20 or 30 years ago. Oh, well, yeah, between the 50s and the 90s. So it's a lot of buildings that have been built in that time. Um, the Labour's calling for a review, you know, like structural reviews. Yeah. That's going to take... I mean, that could take years, mm -hmm. It could take years, which is why they should have started in 2018 when this was first brought to the attention of the Department of Education mm. because the school in Kent had their roof falling in. And luckily and it was a Saturday, wasn't it? it was and there Saturday. were no children there. Exactly. So but, had, had they started in five years ago... The yeah. review might be over now and then the, the bolstering might be finished now. And I think the Times report has a very interesting part in it, which is that the reason they're doing it now is because last week another school collapsed, a school that had been rated safe. So, mm. frankly, they don't know which ones are safe and which ones are not, but if they thought the ones that they were yeah. think were safe did collapse. So then when Nick Gibb, the schools minister, says, don't worry, if your school's not on that list, you can send your kids to school, well, it's not hugely reassuring. So no. Labour have a point here, I think. Mm. But I don't know what we do about it because children have got to go to school, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose the, the systems are now in place for home learning as a result of the pandemic, but it is, having gone through it, it's far unpopular. from ideal. And politically awful. It's just awful. And it feeds into this idea that Labour obviously are trying to push that nothing seems to be working mm. right now. The, the public services are literally on their knees um, mm. and this is not good news for the government mm. at all. Um, let's have a look at the Express. I can't imagine this going down well. This, this concern that the PM may want to bring in thousands of Indian students on visas. Yeah, so Sunak is due to fly to India next week because India is hosting the G20 summit. Uh, and it's also going to be kind of the, the location for continuing to talk to India about a free trade deal. Remember, we're trying to be global Britain after Brexit. We haven't got a trade deal with the US. We no longer have a trade deal with the EU. So we're trying to get an India with, a, a, a trade deal with India. But what Modi wants uh, in return for that is more student visas for Indian students yeah. uh, to come over here. And, you know, the university sector will say that's a good thing. The university higher education is one of the UK's greatest exports Blah, 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 blah. But of course, that's riled some people up at a time when our, um, I think it's net migration. Oh, sorry, net, yeah, net, net migration is over six hundred thousand. So you know, the question is, how is we this going to go down? People, in the, yeah. yeah, do we have this infrastructure for it? And also, how is it going to go down in the Conservative Party, which is already iffy about migration? Mm. Um, very interesting times. Yeah, I mean, that, but it's, that's how trade deals work, isn't it? Now we're now in a situation where we're um, carrying out our own trade deals. But obviously, it's a quid pro quo. So if we say, well, we want your um, products or we want our market to be able to buy stuff from you, they'll say, right, fair enough. But we want increased visas. The, we want more of our people are able to live. Won't the universities in the be quite pleased though, because that means they can charge a lot for Indian students? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, international students pay something like uh, I think something between ten thousand to twenty thousand pounds a year. Mm. So much more than domestic students. Um, and it used to be Chinese students who come here in vast numbers. Since COVID, that's not been so much the case because they haven't been able to leave the country as much. So Indian students and Nigerian students actually have shot up um, in terms of the sheer numbers. Um, but, I, you know, I, I agree with Kevin as well. I think if any kind of migrant we want, it's kind of students who come here for a few years, then they go back taking knowledge. And mm. then some of them might stay and go into yeah. you know, high-skilled jobs. That's the kind of immigrants that we do want if we want immigrants at all. Okay. You can see how like, Conservative MPs are already 
pretty nervous, not very happy yeah. the way things are going. I can understand this. You can see this becoming a political issue for the Prime Minister, without a doubt. Definitely. Mm. Um, now, this is an interesting one, Kevin, in The Guardian. Um, the, the f I mean, the f former... Uh, MPs and ministers and secretaries of state, or oh, you mm. want they want other jobs? Yeah, Obviously, I mean, fair enough. Um, but what about George Eustace, the former environment secretary? Yeah, so he um, stood down um, as environment secretary, and he's standing down as an MP at the next election. Now he's taking on a thirty-six thousand pounds a year consultancy job with uh, a waste treatment company called um, Orgean Limited. Now. Uh, it's controversial. I think people, um, it sticks in their craw a little bit when you see politicians, you know, capitalising on their experience as public servants. Um, what's interesting in particular about this one is that this uh, company were found to have contaminated um, groundwater at a site and were um, uh, investigated by the Environment Agency. So the Guardian are saying, well, hang on a minute, should you really be taking a job with, you know... Well, not if they've cleaned up their act. Well, the, the thing is, is, well, what I was thinking, I mean, if you're being fair to them, you could say, well, you know, if they want to make sure they don't make that mistake again, <laughs> yeah. he's the guy yeah. to come in. You know, he knows how the government works. He knows the department very well, so he can give them that type of advice. I think where it becomes a little bit murky is whether he is going to be lobbying um, on behalf of the, the company. Now, he's not allowed to do that until September next year under the rules. So what is his job title, do we know? Uh, uh, it's a consultancy role. Which oh, it's a consultancy. Oh, yeah. oh, nice. It's a nice wide-ranging <laughs> mm. uh, brief. Very. Um, so, so, yeah, that, they're basically... We're going to see a lot of this in, in the next few months, aren't we? Well, um, so many so many MPs who yeah. know they're either, either going to lose their seat or standing down well, there's loads will already, be looking right, yeah. for really nice jobs. And the market will be flooded. Mm, it will. MPs. <laughs> yeah. Like the groundwater. Yeah. 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 Indeed. So what do you make of it, Cindy? Well, George Eustace says that he was a farmer before he became a politician. You know, he's got all of this agricultural knowledge that he's tapping into. It's not just about his minister role, which, as Kevin says, he's not technically allowed to use until next September anyway. So he's saying, look, they would want me anyway. But yeah. there is a question over, you know, how much does being a former cabinet minister really weigh into how much this company wants him? But then, you know, if Labour win the next election... That, that, that kind of government contact is not going to be useful to the company for much longer. No. <laughs> why, why are we sort of year? raising our eyebrows over things like this? I mean, Jonathan Van Tam going to work for Moderna. Um, why do we feel that's, there's something wrong with this? Using, using your experience, yes, albeit in government, and then with that experience, obviously it makes you a candidate for interesting jobs. Why not? It does, yeah. I just think people... Um, it rests uneasily with them that they see people, and this is how it's perceived. I'm not saying this is how uh, it actually works, but it's perceived that you know these people who gain this knowledge and experience through public service, and then are you know making money out of it. Um, but you know if they're the right person for for the job, then why why shouldn't they? Be yeah. Employed? I think there's also a revolving door thing, right? If if George Eustace used to be the regulator or used to be in charge of regulations for the in this industry, after he stops being that, he goes into private sector. What if he comes back into the regulation role again? That revolving door is actually quite mm. common in Westminster, and I think that's the difficulty there, where mm. regulators are captured because they think later on in life I might get a private contract or whatever it is, or at least that's, that's the fear. Yeah. And occasionally that does come to light um, with, with um, some certain companies. Uh, but, yes, most of the time it's probably very, very above board. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at rent, should we, in the I Weekends, uh, Cindy, which is... Well, look, we, we know all housing costs are going up, but, but it, it is significantly worse for renters, or a lot of renters. Yeah, and this is something quite close to my heart, because I, I rent at the moment, but I'm trying to buy, and in the political discussion, we talk so much about homeowners and mm. mortgage rates going up and the cost of living crisis for homeowners, but actually there's very little scrutiny about what's happening in the rental market. Renters have very little power, and so there's an organisation called Generation Rent, um, and which has worked with the eye to have this data being done. And actually what they found is that rent has gone up by almost just as much as mortgages have gone up during the cost of living crisis. And yet renters had a higher starting point as well. Yeah. And so if you are a mortgage holder as well, you can remortgage to a low, lower mortgage or something like that if you go for a longer, uh, longer, longer time period. For renters, you don't have that option. And it's just dead money. It's dead money. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you don't have that option, which means that you're, people are often trapped in rent that's higher than the mortgage they would be paying on the same property, which is... You know, it's it's a trap. It's an awful situation to be in. Yeah. You, you read some horror stories about rent. I mean, the amount um, people have to put down like six months' rent in advance mm -hmm. in order oh, to yeah. secure a, a, a tenancy. I mean, it's 
I mean, it's changed a lot since when I was renting, but um, it's, it sounds awful. It's a bit depressing. Um, you've got one minute, Kevin, to uh -huh. tell us how you're going to struggle now because there's a there's a blitz on Botox in the song. <laughs> yeah, apparently 900,000 Botox injections take place in the UK every year. And that's <laughs> mainly just you, isn't it? <laughs> well, as you can tell, I'm actually 87. So <laughs> it's definitely worked. You're looking good it's, on it's it. It's worked for me, yeah. thank you. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the government's going to crack down on, on cowboy... Um, Botox people, basically, some uh, use products which aren't licensed or employ people who aren't trained properly mm. to administer it. Uh, the, the Sun has got a campaign going to try and crack down on this and the government say they're going to tighten up the rules so that um, when you get Botox... You know, we've been talking about this, the fact that unlicensed people can give you Botox. Um, we've been talking about terrible. that for it's years and it's, it's been done. It's it's but it's fillers. I'd be more worried about fillers, mm -hmm. which are covered in this as well, because mm -hmm. they're... They can actually have a longer lasting impact, can't yeah. they? Yeah. Well, I was having a conversation with the girls in the office at Spectator about how Botox for girls that they know has become almost like a self care thing to do. It's like doing your nails just to get a Botox in your 30s or your 40s. Yeah. And I'd never heard of that before. So it's just this normalization of plastic surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit worrying, <laughs> I have to say. Um, Cindy, Kevin, we've got to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Good to see you this morning. Um, now, let's see what the weather's going to do. It could be good news. Here's Aiden.